Thank you all so much. Uh, I'm going to invite our panel uh, to come down and take a seat. Um, and just while they're doing that, uh, I would love for everyone just to take a deep breath, come back to the room together. It's an incredible and beautifully affecting piece of work. Um, but if, uh, if everyone, yeah, uh, takes a minute, reorients themselves, um, again, starts to think of the questions that they would like. Um, so I think if we, everyone takes a seat and then I'll do introductions, uh, maybe clap them down because, yeah. Very dutifully turned off my phone during the screening, which means that I lost the uh, the introductions that I had prepped. Um. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay. Um. Oh no, not there. Uh, shall we introduce ourselves? <laughs> um. I'll start. Uh, so my name is Tanaka Mishi. I'm a writer, performer. Um, I've been working kind of extensively with the stories, uh, with, with how we tell stories about sexual violence in our society, with a particular emphasis uh, on male survivors, but by no means working exclusively in that context. Um, so I'm a storyteller myself, and I work with uh, journalists, uh, academics, uh, and often charities uh, to help them tell better stories. And I'm also a trustee uh, at Survivors UK, which is the UK's longest running charity that supports uh, particularly male and non-binary victims of sexual violence. Uh, Shall we go down? Uh, I think that one's you. I, know, I, try, I just tried speaking Can into I? it. No. <laughs> Do you want to swap? I'm number three now. <laughs> um, thank you, Tanaka. Um, I'm Faye Maxted. I'm the Chief Executive of the Survivors Trust. We're a national membership organisation for voluntary sector rape and sexual abuse support services. And I'm a survivor myself, and the work I do is therefore very personal to me, and it drives what I do. And I'm sure that's the same for a lot of people who work in the voluntary sector as well. I'm Hossein, I think now everybody knows me. <laughs> Yeah, producer and the character of that field. Cool. Uh, I'm Ella, the filmmaker. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, so I wanted really to start with the two of you. Um, and one of the things that feels really important doing this work, um, and yeah, like I, so I've. I've had the experience as a survivor of going to a journalist and talking through what's happened to you um, and how exposing that can be and how, how much trust that takes um, on both sides uh, as the person telling that story and the person kind of taking it and starting to shape it into something. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that trust um, and about yeah, the journey of, of this piece. <laughs> um, I think it's a really good and interesting point that you're mentioning because um, especially as a male, given all this stigma and stereotypes, you somehow don't trust anybody to talk about these experiences because you think people are going to judge you from different perspectives and slide of that imagine you want to make it into a film then you want to have someone that you really trust on that and so that they can make a film that it's you you feel connect to that and so anyway it was very hard for me to talk about it and but then my therapist was telling me to talk about and uh, tell about this so i think the for i didn't want to first talk with my parents and so I thought that, okay, I'm going to talk with my wife. She's the person that I trust her most in the entire world. And 
then I even didn't talk to her. I wrote a like Google Sheet, Google Doc, my experiences there. <laughs> and I shared that doc with because we <laughs> with this email <laughs> <laughs> and, and we work we share right a lot of documents with each other because of our work experience. And then she I don't know what she felt, but I shared it through a doc with her and then she read this and I think I think during the entire process, I knew that I could trust her, but during the process, I understand that how much I can trust her. And, and I think the entire journey, uh, our relationship moved to the next level, I guess, during this journey, because I gained a lot of trust to her. And, and it was really indeed important to make sure that some if it's going to be into a, make made into a film it's someone that i really can trust and she is not going to make something out of my experience that i don't think is close to reality or going to hurt me or my family because i didn't want to hurt my family i and or, and i knew that she is not going to hurt me but I was a little bit hesitant at how, is, how she is going to judge my family. But I think she was more careful than me for my parents. And that was, so I, when I see all those stuff, I was like much more um, uh, confident that, okay, she is the best person that's going to do that. I don't know if it answers your question or not. Yeah, perfectly. <laughs> Uh, from my side, so when I received that email and that document and I read it, um, I was like, okay, wow, I have a huge responsibility now. Um, so it wasn't, um, w in that document, we didn't, like at that moment, we didn't want to make a film about it, it was just sharing experience. And I was like, okay, my response to this is going to be like the most important thing probably in our relationship. Um, and I took a few days, I couldn't do anything. And I was just figuring out myself and how I'm gonna um, react to that and how I'm gonna support him the way it should be. Um, so I talked to um, a few of my friends even who I knew their victims as well. And I was like, okay, um how was it for you like what did you expect if you shared it with someone and then after a few days i was like okay let's talk about it <laughs> um and i think yeah after a while when we um, came up with this idea that okay you need to talk to your parents about this and it was a lot of yes and no like back and forth that no one day it was no it's 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 an awful idea and then after two days maybe and you know there was like a lot of back and forth between us um, and then up to the point that he was like okay let's do it like the final yes was um um like the final yes happened and then he was like okay if i want to the hardest thing for me is to share it with my parents if i want to share it with them let's make it into a film so other people can see it and it might help others as well uh, because there are not so many films about it in our region and i don't think if in the world yeah um so that was another that was like another step of this story and i was like okay let's let's think about it a little bit more and then after a few months we decided that okay let's make a film and share the story yeah um i am really glad you did uh and i know i'm not the only one in this room um Faye, i want to bring you in here um i was really excited that you were going to be on this panel because I think you are one of the people, probably relatively few people in this country who have a good overview of what support is available and where and what the landscape is like. Um, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about kind of support for survivors in the UK, what, what's really working, what maybe isn't working. Okay, thanks. Maybe switch that, start, start, <laughs> let's end on the stuff that is working. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's nice to, um, it's nice to go there. Okay, so I think, um, I think for male survivors in particular, it can be really difficult to find services, um, although they're there. And, you know, we've got uh, over 120 member agencies across the UK. 
most of them working with male victims, men and boys, but it's finding those services and that's not easy. And if you go into Google, generally what you find is services for women or it all talks about women. And if that's the first barrier, then the next one is maybe around culture and finding something that actually fits what you want to find from a service. So they're things that you know we're working on and trying to improve that. I would say at the moment in terms of support for survivors, the pandemic had a really awful impact on services. So waiting lists have grown tremendously and for, for people who I have reported and it's going to court, the time to get to court has extended, it's now years sometimes. So the pressure on services and the pressure on survivors is, is really high. So, you know, there are efforts to try and improve things. Um, the government issued a, a Vogue action plan, so it's violence against women and girls, sorry, but, and then they say, and that's for men and boys too. Um, but, you know, speaking as a woman, if there were a violence against men strategy, I would wonder where the women were. So, same, I think, well, men and boys need something too specific. So that's something I think that isn't working yet. Um, and we're, we're working on that, trying to raise that awareness of the need to be very specific about men and boys. Um, in terms of things that are working, I think there is more awareness now. I think it's gradually getting easier to say something, um, although it's still not easy. And, uh, you know, watching the documentary just now, I mean, it made me cry again and because it resonates so strongly and it will do with so many survivors that experience of reaching out and telling someone and then they don't hear or they can't hear because it's too difficult it's not something they ever think about or think would happen to their child that they've loved and protected so you know incredibly powerful and you know in achieving something amazing i think in raising that awareness it's it's part of part of the power of survivors to come forward like that so I, I think you know that's one thing that is working i think yeah i think that's um yeah that that resonates kind of with my experience uh working in the sector as well is that actually there is a lot of beautiful work happening um, and it's happening too quietly. Um, so at Survivors Week UK, we have fantastic things like we have a healing through Dungeons and Dragons group. Because um, lots, lots of blokes do not want to sit in a traditional therapy setting. Um, and so kind of finding innovative and creative ways of creating space, I think, is, is part of the solution that's going on on the ground. And it's part of what you've created here. Um, like, I definitely think it's part of part of our social response to to sexual violence in society um i have a, a kind of like an open question for all of you which is what tools do we need um if if we're looking to build a society in which sexual violence happens much less um and in which when it does happen people come forward and they are heard in that beautiful open way that that you modeled that is caring that is considered and that is supportive what needs to be in place for us to get to that point <laughs> um so last october the independent inquiry into child sexual abuse made 20 recommendations to improve um the situation for children who've been sexually victimized. And so, so far we're still waiting for those recommendations to be put into place. Out of those recommendations, there are two in particular that I think would absolutely make a huge difference. And one is to have a national child protection agency. So at the moment, we don't have a specific agency that focuses in that way on children. 
so various departments in the government are involved and you know we all know too many cooks spoil the broth so you know too many people involved and no one actually accountable a second um a second thing that would make a difference is to have a, a cabinet level minister for child protection so that there is someone nationally that we can turn to and say this is happening what are you going to do about it and i think it's that accountability that needs to make the change and they could then drive forward the awareness that we need to to bring and i think one of the biggest barriers is that lots of people don't really understand what the impact is still and that lifelong potentially lifelong impact um, affecting every aspect of a survivor's intergenerational life intergenerational as well yeah, yeah. absolutely yeah. yeah and i wonder yeah i guess um that's a beautiful very clear and very doable set of actions that the uk to take could take i wonder if you have kind of a, a more global perspective or a perspective about what could happen in Iran and in the region, um, yeah, what 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 are what's missing from the toolbox there? Um, I think in terms of how to support them when it happened, um, I would say just give them the unconditional support that they need first of all. Uh, and also we should educate ourselves how to respond to that uh, because it's not easy as you see um, Hossein's parents are so loving so caring they're brilliant parents they just don't know what to do they just don't know how to react how to show support um, so I think education is basically to me is the most important thing um, and also, I think in Iran, because of the lack of sex education, like there's nothing, nothing there. Um, that's the key. If if there was something, um, we would have seen like less uh, victims, and we would have seen more of um, support from the people, individuals, when they're like family or friends or victims, and when they can heal each other, they can support each other. Um, yeah. Um, I think yet both of you, I think, mentioned about education, which is, I think, really important. I think there is now, as you mentioned, a good level of awareness, kind of, that's okay, this is happening, and people say, yeah, this is happening, we should just stop it. But I guess we rarely educate ourselves about how to support the victims. And because, as you mentioned, we think that this is not going to happen to my children. This is exist, but it's not going to happen to my children. Or we think that's okay. Uh, we hear a lot that it's happening from your friends and family, but we, we trust our family and friend, and we don't think it's going to happen from them. And so, yes, there is a lot of awareness, but that lack of education about how to support our victim is really important, as you both mentioned. And if I want to mention anything else, I would say about that was in the film as well about toxic masculinity. As a male victim, I think it's make it very hard for us. It's a very uh, big barrier in taking support or opening up and talking about them. And I guess we somehow need to redefine the identity of men we need to redefine what it means to be a man i mean whenever i think about what it means to be a man i don't i cannot remember anything aside of being like a muscle man supporting everybody don't showing your emotion not asking for help but helping everybody what 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 it means to be a man what what we can how we re, how we define this when i cannot remember when i cannot come up with another definition how i'm going to break this stigma to ask for mental health and this is something that i guess i don't know if anybody is working on that or this is something that i think i i really want to come up with an answer for that and i don't still have an answer for that I think it's really great to see that a lot of women 
or people from like LGBT community are working on this for themselves. But are we also working on redefining what it means to be a man? So that's something that I guess we need to work on that too. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I think the the really beautiful picture that comes out of all of those answers is um, almost that actually education and courage and dismantling these ideas about um, kind of toxic masculinity and sort of rigid masculinity have to happen at all of these different level levels, right? There's the there's the internal, there's the personal, there's relationships and friends and families, there's governments, national governments, and then of course there's kind of the international level and what we do as a as a whole world. Um, I think yeah, that's the that's part of um, again what the documentary illustrates really beautifully is that actually this comes down to just people trying to have these conversations with each other. Um, like that's the starting point. Um, and yeah, that, I think the thing again that, that came particularly out of your answer is that I think there's a level of courage that is needed. Um, you know, survivors have been being really brave in lots of ways. And I think that actually governments and the people around us need to meet us in that courage. Um, that wasn't a question, that was a soapbox, sorry. Thanks, <laughs> Julie. Um, how are we for time? That is a question. Okay, great. Um, I think we'll do one more, I'll, I'll ask one more question and then we'll move to Q&A. Um, so both online and in the room, uh, start thinking about what you would like to, to ask the amazing people we have. Um, but yeah, my last question, I guess, again, to, to everyone is, um, what, are there any moments in the documentary, I suppose, for you that you're proud of uh, and for you, Faye, that are really gonna stick with you? Um, I also am gonna give an answer to this because I have one. Um. <laughs> um, absolutely, and it, it's the point where you're talking to your mum, Hussein, and I think I uh, spoke to Chris and told her the second, the minutes and seconds into the, <laughs> into the documentary that where it really, really got to me. And, I, you know, it, it's so clear that, that your mum and dad are beautiful, loving parents and protected you as much as they could and felt they had. And that's the same for lots of parents. And um, unfortunately, abusers are very clever at grooming children, at grooming parents. And, you know, that's, that's a battle that, that we really have to fight. It's awareness again. Uh, because so many children do tell their parents, they do say something, and it's that it's that not wanting to believe that something so awful could have happened to your child. So I, that's the moment that, and it was so beautifully done, absolutely beautiful Very to well. watch that. I, yeah, and you know, from the bottom of my heart, thank you both for for producing such an amazing piece of work. Thank so. you for your comments. Thank you. <laughs> it's it's so heartwarming, actually. Receiving this comment is so heartwarming. Um, if I want to say about what I'm proud of, like, dear, I think the entire process was making me very proud of both of us, I guess. And um, I think I really, I'm really proud of my mom now. It's never nobody asked me this question. I'm just thinking about this now. <laughs> And I, it's a very weird answer, I guess, but you know why? Because she, as I mentioned, she didn't know what she had to do. As I mentioned, she didn't know what she had to do there, but she wanted to help. And you will, you will see that. So she see me there and I'm distressed. She just don't know what she had to do, how she has to support me but she wants to support the only option that's, and there is a big taboo to talk about that conversation and she 
doesn't want to break that taboo. She can't break that taboo and talk about it. The only option that she comes with is to ask my brother to take me some blanket. It wasn't cold, the river in there. <laughs> it was summer, yeah, it was summer. <laughs> And basically, yeah, that's, like 40 degrees. It's, we live in like home, we're in the middle of desert. <laughs> and it's like summer, and we are in the rooftop because we need a little bit cold. And the only option that she comes is that go and take him some blanket. And, and that was the moment that I realized that she really wants to help. So because one of my biggest struggle was to understand why she didn't do anything when I told her when I was a child. And that was really devastating for me when I saw that I told it again and they didn't reply back. But her, that reaction of her was mean, meant a lot to me. And I got that. And that helped me to reestablish a blameless uh, connection with my parents. And I think I'm so proud of her that she showed that in some way she didn't know to do. She haven't had anything, but she showed it in some way, and that helped me. And did you notice that uh, while it was happening, or when you saw the film? I think that Sorry, I didn't got talk it. About this <laughs> I think. I, <laughs> I think. Uh, I think I told it. I should told it to you at some point that. Uh, from the moment I told, from the moment that my father started to talk about jewelry, until the moment that my mother told to get her blanket, I couldn't understand what's happening there. I didn't understand one word from that conversation. I, I understood all of that after I watched the film. But that moment that she was trying to support me, that was something that like, uh, empowered me to reestablish myself. And also, I'm proud of you. For, because you empower both of us to go through that journey and you helped me a lot or both of us I think to stand against all these stigmas and stereotypes and yeah thank you very much. I try not to hug you that much anymore in front of cameras but <laughs> thank you. Um, okay you want to go next and then I'll go yeah, next. Yeah sure. Um... So my my moment that stuck with me was was the moment that gave us the title. It was the "Can I Hug You," um, and the reason being that I yeah I've been doing doing sort of looking for these kinds of stories I guess my entire uh, career, and one of the things I know through having encountered thousands of them is that our instinct in our society around telling stories about male survivors is to really tighten the frame. Um, if you think about Terry Crews, um, you know, testifying during the Me Too trials or, um, you know, any of the other reporting that we really have seen, um, there is a huge resistance to having a, a male survivor speaking and then to having friends, family, partners, loved ones around that person. That is something that, you know, graphically almost, you never see. And so it was that moment where I was watching you talk and I could see you in the frame. Um, that is a genuinely revolutionary shot moment um, because we really, I think, as a, as a, in this conversation, we want to see male survivors as completely disconnected as an issue from everything else in our society from all other forms of violence and from all the other forms uh, of abuse um, and so seeing that connection um yeah i um there is a way in which i've been looking for that for the past seven eight years of of my career i'm conscious of time as well but i want to comment something about that it, i never told this again but it's, it's it's interesting that we come up with something that i never talked about them so I think everybody thinks that the last scene that I'm talking with my parents is the hardest one for me. But actually that scene that you mentioned was the hardest one for me. And because you know, you're not supposed to talk about this kind of stuff with your wife and you're not, as a man, you're not supposed to ask help from your woman in that toxic masculinity area. 
And but with your parents, you are kind of more comfortable to ask for help and ask like talk with them. But that's that. So why even though people think the last thing was the hardest one, but that thing was actually the hardest one. And it's really interesting that you catch that as well. And it's very like touching for me that you catch it. You, are, I think you are the only one that's talking about this, and it's very interesting for me. <laughs> um, so, if I want to mention one thing that I'm really proud of in this film as a filmmaker, um, is that it there's a very narrow line between um, showing his parents' character a very, you know, um, it, you could have simply um, judge them and think that, okay, they're awful parents. I mean, they've made mistakes, obviously, that is obvious to us, but um, to make this film in a way that is more constructive and it's more, um, I didn't want to judge them, I want to find, okay, why? I wanted to find this answer, okay, why? If, um, if your mom didn't support you, why? I could understand her. I, could understand, okay, the taboo, she was a um, 22, 23 year old mom, uh, his, and her son is like seven, eight years old, and how, and um, she left the school when she got married at the age of 13, and I was like, okay, I understand why, but it needs to be reflected in the film, and I don't want to make a film to judge some, like, neglect parents, you know, um, and I think it's doing the job, I think it's, um, based on the um, comments and based on the feedbacks that I receive, I think it's doing that job well. Yeah. You did it great. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so we're going to take our first question from uh, the live stream, I think. Um, online, they ask uh, for both Elahi and Hussein. How did you? You talked about this a bit in the beginning, but how did you muster the courage to tell such a powerful and personal story? Were there moments that you were scared to finish the journey when it got difficult, and how did you get past those feelings to finish to finish the film? Um, so it's an interesting question because for me, I was like, okay, um, we're making this film, but I'm not going to share this, the fact that we're making this film until I show him a cut, like a rough cut. So um, he sees how it's going to be um, out and if, if he's still comfortable sharing it. Uh, so we did that. And um, one thing that was really hard for me that I was like, okay, should I um, stop it here or um, I have to carry on, uh, was the scene that he's talking with his parents because, because I was there um, um, with two responsibility. One it was his wife uh, who could support him at that scene, but um, I was intentionally um, staying like a little bit away from that, so leave it to him and his parents, uh, but also I was a filmmaker there and then um, I knew how important it is to make this film and I knew that he really wants that film to be um, made and to be seen and I was like, okay, sh like at that moment that I could see how distressed he is, I was like, okay, should I interfere or I should stay behind the camera, what should I do? So um, yeah, there were moments like that, um, but I'm glad I, Carried on. Uh, so we're going to go into the room now. Uh, I think what I'll do is I'm going to pick three people at a time and then we'll just, um, uh, just so I remember who has hands up. So I'm going to go you in the fantastic sweater. Uh, we're then going to go down here in the front green jacket and then yep, at the back in the pink and blue. Okay, so um, I think something that I found really um, just unique and amazing about this film was the fact that it's your story um, and you have had such a input in the editorial process. And I think that's so important for telling your story in a way that you wanted to be told in a sensitive way. Um, and I think I'd love to get a sense of in quite mainstream media, 
this potentially isn't always the case. I mean, stories about survivors are being reported by external journalists, external filmmakers who perhaps haven't experienced similar things. I think I'd like to get a sense of what can journalists or filmmakers do to approach subjects more sensitively and kind of where are we at, at the moment with that? I can do that one if you like. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think uh, what can journalists do more? Um, I mean, there, there's actually, there's a fair bit of kind of guidance for working with survivors and victims of sex offenses in general um, out there. I know Ipso have a, a really great um, piece of guidance. I would say that I had input on it. Um, but I think if there was a sort of like, sort of approach answer, um, one of the things I think we should remember is that survivors of sexual violence in some form are a massive portion of audience. Um, like we also read newspapers, we also watch films, etc. Um, and what I don't see is journalists really getting interested in kind of what do survivors want to see? Um, what is that kind of, yeah, like who is that audience? Um, what are their references? Um, how can we kind of cater to them as a primary audience? Um, and also just again, you know, journalists are people. I see a massive lack of reflexivity and a massive lack of awareness for journalists who have experienced sexual violence. Um, and that means that, you know, I've often worked with journalists who say kind of privately or quietly, I'm a survivor too, but I absolutely can't let that into my work. And often that makes the work worse because they are, they kind of know how a sensitive approach would go and they're sort of actively fighting that part of themselves. Um, and at, at the very least, it makes something which feels very conflicted um, and can actually be quite, kind of, I would argue, even more insensitive. So that is absolutely on employers and institutions to create a space where actually sexual violence is taken seriously in those workplaces, the mental health effects of uh, kind of previous sexual violence is taken seriously and journalists are supported and actually where we can walk away from the idea that journalistic objectivity is possible when you're talking about a topic like this. I think transparency and openness is what we need, but I think if we're trying to do journalistic objectivity there, we will fail in all of the worst ways. End rant. <laughs> Thank you. I think we were down here with the green jacket next. I suppose I had more practical questions about how you would even hold the camera in such uh, during such a personal conversation. Is it like, um, did you foresee the film being shown in Iran? Um, how did the how did the whole family feel about that process of being filmed? Um, just yeah, more about the process, how it practically went with them? Um, yeah, I think uh, so that was really so I think it's kind of related to your question as well that you asked. So when we wanted to make this uh, film, us was something, but also how our parents are thinking was something else. And then after finishing shooting, we realized that, okay, we need to somehow be careful about the people in the post-production as well, because these people also somehow relate to some similar experiences and it's very difficult for them to also edit or make animation. So our animation, it's like one, two minute animation, but it took three months. And then it was very heavy for our animation team to make those like very, Hard one. So it, it's, we needed to come up with some process to make sure everybody is safe. But with my parents, it was very tricky because we didn't want to tell them in advance before shooting and we didn't do that. But then after that, we wanted to make sure they are fine as well. And then, so basically the short answer was that we didn't tell them what's going on, what's, what is going to happen. And I was very stressed before shooting as well because I will, I want, I didn't know what, there was some personal aspect for me. And then I, I did, I was so stressed for that and they didn't know I'm going to talk about that as well. So we didn't tell them, but then of course, after the shooting and the film finished, we needed to talk about that. And we need to know how they are feeling about this and all those stuff. So they were quite 
I think everybody in our family is used to the fact that the a camera is around because <laughs> Allah is a filmmaker and not in, only in my family, in her family, everybody is used to the fact that the camera all the time is around. And because our previous film was also in our family, so it was quite like like normal thing for them. Okay, there is two camera here. Oh, hello. Hello <laughs> again, and then it's like we every time we fly back. So now they only they also know our crew. So okay, <laughs> it's like this is Elaha, this is her DOP. <laughs> Hossein is doing some stuff there as well. <laughs> so it's 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 used for them, but the process to make sure that they are fine with what we are going to release was a little bit harder. We need to make sure how they are feeling and all those stuff, and then we talk with them and they find so my father is still like that you should not release that film not because of themselves because she thinks that if i release that film it will damage me and she's saying that okay you don't know it will ruin your career it will might you you might be going to a point that even your wife divorced you and yeah it's like this kind of mindset but yeah it's it, it was like this i don't know if it answers your question <laughs> There was another question. Yeah, so I think we're going to the back in the pink and blue jumper. It's a good jumper game in this audience. <laughs> Hi, um, I just wanted to ask you both. Um, first, Hossein, as a survivor, you were talking earlier about um, redefining what it means to be a man and how important that is in society. Um, not only in society, but also like from academia and from journalism. And I was wondering if you believe that's a job that should be done mainly from inside feminism itself, or if we need to strengthen the men and masculinity studies area to talk about that. And then also, um, Elahi, as a filmmaker as well, if you take any of these approaches when you're making a film like this. Uh, yeah, so I think the question's about, kind of two questions, right? Does the kind of unpicking of these toxic masculine traits need to come from within kind of feminist studies in the academy or within kind of men and masculinities area? Is that right? So should we do that one first? Does that feel? To be honest, I don't know if I'm the right person to answer that. <laughs> but perhaps people who know how to there are like different groups of people in this room, I guess, from journalism, activists and all those people. Maybe you can better answer that question. I just, as a person, felt that there is a lack of this that I felt. And as an individual, yeah, I felt that, okay, there is a lack here and I'm feeling this lack, but who is going to take care of that? I, I don't know if I'm the right person to answer that. Maybe you know better. I think um, I think you're absolutely the right person to tackle that, <laughs> but but not on your own. I think we all need to take responsibility, and um, you know the myths around sexual violence around male victims feed into that toxic masculinity dialogue, and, and we really need to challenge that and break that down. Um, you know, when you were talking earlier, I was thinking, you know, the impact on male victims, the number of suicide, you know, the increased risk for male victims of, of suicide and, you know, severe uh, mental impact of what they've been through. We need to challenge um, how men see themselves, how they view reaching out for help when they need it, and to not see that as a weakness but as a strength and you know to value that emotional intelligence and the ability to really understand our own emotions um i think the academic studies are, are great we we need more of that definitely looking at the theories around how society constructs stereotypes and myths and and how that feeds into toxic masculinity but it's it's time we were rid of it absolutely and to value the strong compassionate kind and caring men um, who outnumber the ones who harm children and i guess in terms of maybe like the slightly more practical um kind of where in the academy does it come from aspect i think my take is uh both unnecessary and they need to be 
extr like working extremely closely, um, if only because so many of these things have impacts that affect each other. Um, so in my last book, one of the examples I used was um, the impact of sexual violence against men uh, in uh, uh, Central Africa on the local economy and, all, and the kind of cascading impacts onto women and girls. Um, you know, if your father is too traumatized to go out to work, that affects someone has to someone has to earn a living. Your mother has to go out to work. Suddenly, you're looking after the kids, and you don't get the kind of education um, that you might have had. So these these issues are so tightly knitted together that I don't think it should come from any one place. Um, and then I might skip over the second question if you if you don't mind, just so we have an, one more voice, if that's OK. But we'll be around, be around afterwards to chat. Um, we're going to do one last question. And I saw a hand, that green t-shirt. Sorry, I'm making you run up and down with the microphone. Hi, um, my name's Saga. I'd just like to intersect what you said about the abuse that happens in Africa um, of children, whether it's boys and girls and with the journalism side that I missed um, earlier. There's a journalist, international journalist, called Siddharth Kara, Indian, Indian guy. He'd been given privy access last year to mines in Congo, um, highlighting for the first time international access to the Congo mines where you've got, he showed it on his video, 200,000 people is a mixture of boys, girls, and men, and women, all scrabbling on top of each other like their ants to get the cobalt. And if you then intersect that with the insatiable appetite that we now have to go net zero in the global north, how do we actually get those conversations on the table? Because the more I look at these supply chains for going net zero, the more I'm seeing it's littered with sexual and human rights abuses. And how do we tackle that issue? Thank you. Uh, can, can I rephrase it? Um, I suppose, yeah, the, the question, correct me if I'm wrong, the question is a, a big one for our last five minutes. Um, how do we... Uh, kind of report um, responsibly on uh, kind of some of the sexual violences and other human rights abuses that happen uh, in these big supply chains, which are, which are driven by kind of global north agendas like like net zero. Um, and yeah, how do we how do we bring that story to the table? Um, does anyone have quick, uh, quick, but also nuanced? <laughs> happening in this area perhaps yeah i i think what what i would say is that um sexual abuse of children is a, a billion billion dollar industry globally and so and it's happening everywhere every country um and and generating as i say billions in terms of revenue for people who don't care where their money comes from um and I count in that the um, big internet providers um, include uh, and including industries where, where children are abused in other ways, where they're used to, um, I don't know, make trainers or clothes and, you know, working from, from a very young age and abused in a whole range of ways. So I see industry as needing to be held responsible. They're making profits and then making profits out of children. So I would say we need some really strong uh, action to bring them into line and to take responsibility and be held accountable. And I think with the, with the reporting question, um, I think as much as we can be interested, not just in what happens to particular survivors, but in their perspectives and what they think about the forces that have led them to where they are. I think that's the key. Um, like I, you know, journalistic uh, expectation is who, what, when, where, why. Um, but what does that person think, I think is the, 
key question, and I've never seen that lead us to the wrong place. Um, that is all the time we have. I'm so, so grateful for you all being here. I'm just going to ask for one more a round of applause for fantastic panel of fantastic piece. Thank you. Um, this um, we're so honored to be a little step on the journey of this film. It's going to have a ripple effect and a long tail. So um, I wish you all the best for the next steps. But <laughs> thank you um we're now having a um short break and then it'll be the final session where we have meet the commissioners i can see that already here over there and um, because i'm um, we've already today had several questions about the commissioning process so hopefully you'll all stick around for that last session see you then Tell the man in the mirror, step up, you better be true. Fear the man that be governing you, yeah. Fear the man that got nothing to lose, yeah. Still we hustle, we struggle, we choose. Still we live and we love and we lose, yeah. No fear that don't be no spirit, no cool. Fear man, though we hollow, we choose.